Hello, and welcome to Galen Data's Medical Device Connectivity Innovation Webinar Series. My name is Keith Drake. I'm the Director of Business Development for Galen Data. With me today are our co-founders, Chris DuPont, Abbas Dilawala, and Alice Condon. Welcome, gentlemen. Our topic today is Medical Device Connectivity Outlook for 2020, Technology Trends and Tips You Need to Know to Succeed This Year and Beyond. Before we get started, I'll go over some webinar logistics. You can submit your questions at any time in the questions window to the right in your console. If we don't get to your question during the Q&A session, we'll follow up with you after the webinar. Handouts overviewing Galen data and our current incentive program are available. And a recording of this webinar will be provided in a follow-up email to all attendees. And of course, you can contact us anytime if you think we can help with your connectivity needs by sending an email to sales at galendata.com. We've got a lot, of, a lot of ground to cover today. Now, the first trend that we'll talk about is think how AI and data analytics are affecting medical device development and rollout. And then we'll transition to connect, specifically how 5G connectivity is shaping the landscape for medical devices. We'll then talk about reach, how telemedicine is affecting the landscape. And then finally talk about rules, privacy, security, and regulatory. Um, Chris, before we do dive into our four trends, I'd like to turn things over to you so you can briefly overview for our audience who Galen Data is, what the Galen Cloud is, and how we might be able to contribute to their efforts. Thanks, Kate. It's an honor and privilege to be here with you all today. Galen Data is a configurable, scalable software platform that makes it easy to connect medical devices to an FDA compliant cloud. We do it at a fraction of the cost and schedule, along with providing a host of other services. Now, when a medical device manufacturer decides to connect, they can simply use the Galen platform to create a data model of their device and have connectivity in a matter of weeks. From a platform perspective, Galen takes care of all the FDA regulations, ISO standards, cybersecurity, and HIPAA requirements. Galen is also certified to the medical device quality management system, ISO 1345. Next slide, please. Benefits of connected health. Let's start with remote monitoring. It's no longer limited to physician video conferencing through a webcam, but also you can act, get access to remote sensor data. There's also opportunities for improved clinical trial compliance by immediate access to results. Higher reimbursement raises. Improved insurance payments through real-time objective evidence of use. Medical devices are third-payer systems, and if you can prove that your device is being used, it can help facilitate payment from third-party payers. FDA and NEST, we support collaboration between industry and regulators. New business model, such as Galen is a SaaS model, you can also generate new revenue streams for diagnos diagnosis and devices. Device surveillance. There is no equivalent of a check engine medical device, a check engine for medical devices in today's world, but being able to provide the equivalent of a check engine light for remote diagnostic information of that very medical device to tell when the battery is low, the lead impedance issue, or simply when there's electronic failure. Uh, you can do that through remote access. Back to you, Keith. Thank you, Chris. Uh, before we dive into our first trend, we'd like to get a feel for who's attending today. So we're going to launch a quick poll you should see in your console right now. The poll will ask you, what is your current connectivity focus? Uh, connectivity is already implemented. Connectivity is in design development. You're working on it. Number three, you're definitely planning on connectivity, but have not taken any action yet. You're not sure if you need connectivity or not. And then finally, you don't feel you need connectivity. We'll leave this poll open for about 15, 20 seconds. Another 10 seconds to leave the poll open. Don't worry, you won't be graded.
And I see lots of answers coming in. And we'll go ahead and close the poll in three, two, one. Final answers, please, and we'll close it. All right, I'm looking at the results here and, and pretty much as we've seen before, you're either definitely planning on connectivity or it's in design development are the majority of the responses. Let's talk about Think, the fact that medical devices are growing in intelligence. You know, uh, not a day goes by without seeing an advertisement on television about a product or a service that is called powered by AI. Uh, today, we'll overview how artificial intelligence and data analytics relate to medical devices and what to look for in 2020 and beyond from a regulatory view. Let's start first with three key concepts. Here in the upper left, medical device. I'd encourage you to think more broadly about what a medical device is. At Galen Data, we consider a medical device to be some combination of the sensor platform, the implantable, the wearable, the near patient device or gadget uh, that measures data from the patient. But it could also include a base station or a charging station with connectivity between that and the sensor platform. There could be a smartphone or web app involved. And then finally, some functionality could reside in the cloud. All four of these could potentially comprise a medical device. In the lower left, I'd like you to think broadly about what medical device data could be. Uh, certainly there's the physiological data that we're measuring of the patient, the vital signs. There's also therapeutic data, both in and out of the device to apply uh, perhaps neurostimulation to the patient. There's demographic information that's provided by the device, not specifically vital signs, but other information about the uh, patient, eating habits, sleeping quality. And then finally, as Chris mentioned a couple slides ago, device status, battery level, other diagnostic information. So with that as a baseline, over on the right, you can see I've made an attempt to define AI and data analytics. We could probably spend all day, all week talking about this. But very succinctly, we consider data analytics to be data, the types of data we've already talked about, coming into an automated process that applies statistics, database management, methods to deal with uncertainty, fuzzy data, uh, missing data, data analysis techniques, and then more subjective heuristics. All these combine in an automated fashion to produce actionable information. So the result is often software modules, medical device software modules, that appear to think, process, analyze, or reason intelligently. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to artificial intelligence. Um, these are just some examples here. I'll read these quotes to you briefly because I think they're very powerful. About a year ago, the commissioner of the FDA publicly stated that, quote, artificial intelligence and machine learning have the potential to fundamentally transform the delivery of healthcare in areas as of earlier disease detection, more accurate diagnosis, more targeted therapies, and other improvements in, in personalized medicine. I know for us at Galen Data, it's very encouraging to see the FDA take a forward-looking approach toward the benefits of artificial intelligence. Uh, Jennifer Schaff, who is a managing director at Elder Research, a leading data analytics firm, uh, was recently quoted that advanced data analytics and AI are revolutionizing healthcare, particularly in the area of wearable sensors. They can be the first line of defense in detecting and reporting anomalous conditions of the body. There's a lot of potential here, a lot of potential in identifying trends in patient populations, such as detecting disease onset earlier, uh, diagnostics to identify device issues before they become apparent to either the clinician or the patient. And then the bottom line here is that artificial intelligence is truly individualizing patient care. It's acting as a constant companion watching over your health and your well being. Now, let's broaden those benefits to what we call here at Galen Data cloud AI. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of value that is present when artificial intelligence resides in the device firmware itself and processes data from a single device. But that benefit is even more powerful. It's multiplied if the AI occurs in the cloud in a single location 
rather than distributed among hundreds or thousands of individual devices. We can take advantage of extremely uh, massive computing power, data storage, data access. It gives us access to an incredibly rich data set. Data, not just from that medical device, not just from the other hundreds or thousands of similar medical devices, but from other sources of information too, that can all be brought into the AI process to provide actionable information. And then certainly having the AI, having any computational software in a single uh, readily accessible location provides advantages in configuration and control, regulatory and protection of intellectual property. So the cloud and AI-based systems can analyze orders of magnitude more data, more robust data with more powerful analytic algorithms as compared to doing that on a single medical device. Finally, I'll mention that the FDA considers AI as a medical device. They are only, they've only recently been permitting AI as a medical device. Here on the left, you see their media release and it reads, that it's about two years old now, so fairly recent, that the FDA permitted marketing of the first medical device to use artificial intelligence. It's an application to detect um, eye disease, uh, diabetic retinopathy in adults who have diabetes. This is the first example, and it's the first of several that have followed. Over here on the right, this is very interesting, and it may be the topic of a future webinar by Galen Data, and that is the FDA about a year ago put out a discussion paper and request for feedback. The point here is that currently FDA clearance for AI technology is for locked algorithms. Algorithms that are developed, saved, and implemented and do not change until manually uh, revised. What the, AI is, what the FDA is considering is artificial intelligence implemented that learns based on observations that self-modifies. Uh, they're accepting that, that, that this is the future and they're developing regulatory guidelines for clearing devices that do that. Uh, before I turn it over to Alex, I'll mention that um, two companies, these are examples that are currently uh, developing products for the marketplace that are based on AI. The first is June Brain, uh, which uses machine learning to analyze changes in retinal uh, pathology to provide home monitoring of MS patients. Uh, what this leads to is earlier detect detection of disease progression. It's a technology that works. Another technology that works is from Paramus. They've used machine learning to analyze pulse waveform signals for their unique continuous blood pressure monitoring platform. So there's a lot in AI and data analytics is, is our future. I'd encourage you all to think about how you could leverage that technology now. Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the next trend, which is Connect. Thanks, Keith. So 5G has been a long time coming and it's a very hype technology. Uh, the data constraints for internet enabled devices working in remote locations has proven historically uh, to be an issue. Uh, so 5G seems to be a good answer right now. Uh, 5G has the promise to be transformative both initially inside the hospital and later on as the infrastructure grows, transformative outside as well. Next slide. So what does 5G mean for medical devices? The ability to move large quantities of data off device combined with the increasing processing power of the cloud will enable remote imaging services and computationally intensive post-processing uh, to flourish. Um, you can see from the image below, uh, there's a breakdown of current speed versus coverage. Uh, one of the things that's important to note about 5G is that the infrastructure um, is both costly and laborious to install. Uh, you typically need a physical antenna on top of buildings, uh, and for that reason, hospitals will probably be early adopters with more rural areas being a laggard. Um, this is unfortunate because um, of just how much more those kind of isolated communities uh, can benefit. And one of the things that I always joke about is you see on the side of the road these, these signs that say like, you know, we buy ugly houses. Uh, soon, I'm, I'm sure you'll see something that says like, we lease rooftops <laughs> um, because of just how many antennas that you will need for this infrastructure to really take off. Um, next slide. So when it comes to physical devices, um, not apps or something, there's typically a gap when it comes to adoption. Um, and we don't foresee 5G having the impact we believe it can uh, for at least a few years. 
uh, with the ability of 5G to move post-processing off of hospital infrastructure, uh, it'll be interesting to see all of the benefits that can come out of something just as simple as moving patients to Wi-Fi networks and keeping 5G antennas for heavy lifting. Um, how much uh, do processes change when large image files can be downloaded in seconds instead of minutes? Um, you know, 5G robotic surgery has already been successfully tested in China, and how will that potentially impact um, surgeries here, and how long will that will that take to kind of come to fruition? Uh, next slide. Uh, one technology that I'll touch on briefly because it, it tends to be kind of uh, the technology that most people tie closely to uh, to 5G is augmented reality. Uh, augmented reality, we feel, is still a ways away from um, kind of coming to adoption in a uh, kind of an in-situ uh, situation, uh, but 5G is kind of quickly collapsing that timeline. So two companies that I'll highlight, one is Metaviz and the other one is XR Health. If you're not familiar with the term XR, that, that means mixed reality. Um, so some, some use augmented, some use uh, virtual, or companies do both, you'll see XR a lot. Um, and both are kind of leading the way in terms of technology, um, and they're both, they're both well-funded. Uh, I believe Metaviz raised around in 2018, uh, no, 2019, and XR, XR did this, this year. Um, Metaviz has partnered with Verizon um, to grow out their surgical assistance platform. Uh, they had a, um, a spot, I believe, at the during the Super Bowl, this, this past Super Bowl. Um, and uh, augmented reality technologies like remote rendering, spatial mapping, precision guidance, all have strong medical use cases uh, once this technology is kind of fully fleshed out. All right, thank you, Alex. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to switch now to the trend of reach, how there's a lot going on in extending the clinical range of medical devices. Chris, over to you. Hey, Keith, thanks again. <laughs> I'd like to talk about two specific use cases. Keith, can you go to the next slide, please? Telemedicine. Often when we think of telemedicine, we think about a physician working remotely with a patient through a webcam. I know that in this virus, in my family, we've done several uh, remote webcam conferences with our physicians. But what about remote access to sensor data? Is that a form of telemedicine? We were approached by a pharmaceutical company that was introducing a new drug in a clinical trial of 500 and more patients. Now, what does this have to do with telemedicine? They wanted to measure the temperature of each patient every hour over a three-month period of that clinical trial. There were multiple patients at multiple clinical sites. How to do that easily, consistently, and efficiently? Lack of compliance or reliable temperature measurements would jeopardize that study. The pharmaceutical company found a new wearable temperature sensor that could transmit information to a local smartphone, but that was it. There was no ability to get remote access to those temperature readings. Intergalen data, a pre-existing FDA compliant platform purpose built for this very scenario. Within days, we had a prototype transmitting temperature readings to a secure Galen cloud with controlled access for both the patient and study coordinator. That was a real use case for Galen. Next slide, uh, Keith, please. The next use case I'd like to talk about is Vulcan, a mixed reality smart ultrasound device. Vulcan is a customer of Galen with deep roots to NASA. The original idea was to provide procedural ultrasound guidance using a localized GPS like coordinating system coordinate system that provided step-by-step real-time navigation used by a non-medical person to diagnose medical conditions for long-duration space missions. It uses a mix of heads-up display, a commercial ultrasound, and some very, very sophisticated custom software to make all that happen. If this technology can be used in deep space missions, and the re reason is there's a 30-minute delay between Earth and a mission to Mars, but it can surely also be used here on Earth in remote locations or just literally across the street. The system has two modes. It can work in that autonomous mode when there isn't direct guidance, or it can work with a remote physician providing direct oversight. Galen is the cloud behind Vulcan providing access to that data. Both use cases show real world examples of the outlook for medical device connectivity and the trend the medical device industry is headed in. Having remote access 
to data is key in both of these use cases. Back to you, Keith. Thank you, Chris. That's, that's interesting that you, you really broaden the perspective of, of what we should think of as telemedicine when you provide cloud connectivity that really extends the reach of a wide range of traditional medical devices. That's good. I like that. Uh, our last trend for the day is rules, privacy, security, and regulatory. Abbas, it's your turn. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so we'd like to talk about some of the uh, challenges we see in, in connectivity, right? So once you start collecting data uh, and, and put them in the cloud, uh, the first thing to think about is how does it affect uh, privacy of the data, the privacy of the patient um, by collecting that data. So some of the things we want to see is one, uh, there is an increase, um, uh, globally there is an increased push towards uh, defining more rules, uh, uh, more severe rules uh, around uh, loss of privacy. So how who has control over data, what happens when the data control is lost, uh, who can process, what can they process, what they have to tell people to process. And this is an example, you know, two recent laws, when I said GDPR has been two years old, but it's still recent co comparatively. Um, so GDPR uh, went into effect uh, roughly two years ago. Um, it, it has a definition of data, um, what, what is protected which is much more broader than what we see in uh, things like HIPAA, right? So that's one thing. The other thing it has is this geo uh, geographical provision where it's effectively applies to anybody who tries to sell uh, to the European Union citizens or residents, but also regardless of where they are. So if you have a European citizen in the United States, for example, and you're selling services or you have data uh, of that person, GDPR, even though the jurisdictions are different, it still applies. So it's kind of very really broad, essentially makes it a global reach. And then California essentially passed a very similar law um, that went into effect this year called the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA for short. Similar provisions applies to residents of California, uh, regardless of whether they're actively in California right now. Um, so again, has some broader global reach, or at least national reach. Um, there's some differences, you know, CCP has some exceptions in terms of uh, if you are a small company, you don't have enough revenue, it doesn't apply, GDPR does not. But that's kind of the push we see in, in the global uh, regulatory environment where they're pushing for more and more privacy uh, control. So when you start collecting data and start putting it in, in, into the cloud, you need to start thinking about all the uh, provisions that are coming. Uh, and how do you protect them? How do you protect the data? And how do you protect yourself in, in terms of you know, what to do when breaches happen? Because breaches probably will happen at some point. Next slide, please. Kind of related uh, thing is security. Uh, obviously, security affects privacy. Uh, but we also see, while we see a lot of privacy protections, we also see security breaches going up. Uh, so in 2019, for example, uh, those 37% increase in security breaches in the United States alone. And that basically affected you know, twice as much patient records as they did in 2018. So a lot, a, lots of potential. That, that trend doesn't seem to be slowing down. We already have uh, quite a bit uh, increase in this year um, in, in security breaches in the, in the first five months that we have data for than we had it in 2019. So security breaches going up, uh, privacy controls also going up. So that kind of puts us in a bind in terms of you know, how to protect data. And you really need to kind of have a plan and need to understand uh, the technologies that are available uh, to manage your data and to secure data. Um, most of the information that we see uh, being, being at risk is generally identified information, um, like your know, name, address, uh, biometric data a lot and then diagnostics or so specific images. That's kind of what uh, a lot of the uh, hackers are going after. The other thing, because of all these uh, breaches that are happening, uh, the regulatory agencies like FDA and, and, and others are starting to put a lot more emphasis uh, into your security plan. So, you know, they want to see your cybersecurity risk analysis, they want to see your maintenance plan that addresses cybersecurity. How do you patch? How do you monitor? How do you actively uh, notify users? Uh, so there's a lot of emphasis around uh, cybersecurity in medical devices. And that, again, we do not see that going down. Um, next slide, uh, Keith. Um, and again, a related thing is regulatory changes on how 
um, cloud systems or data systems are being classified. So one example is uh, in the US a few years ago, the FDA carved out a provision uh, called the medical device data systems uh, to kind of deregulate to some degree uh, or put less like, less burden on systems that only collect data and display as is. They don't do any kind of uh, interpretation of the data, uh, but they're just taking data and displaying it. Uh, they've been displaying in different ways, but at least they're just displaying raw data. So that kind of systems became much easier to build, uh, much easier to kind of manage uh, because of the FDA's um, relaxing of some of the rules. And the FDA is doing something very similar uh, with uh, another provision called the uh, Clinical Data System, uh, Clinical Decision Systems, CDS. Uh, it's still a draft version out there, but that's what they're going after as well, is to try to deregulate some of the categories of medical. However, having said that, they continue to refine these functions of what will be and will not be controlled. So the environment right now is you do not know what will happen. You know, what, what's the process? Where, where is something being regulated? Where is something regulated? So what we advise always is to always assume that your systems, if they deal with medical devices, are going to be regulated. And you, you prepare that way. You, you develop that way. You deploy that way. That way it changes in the regulatory system to not affect as much. Uh, one good example is the MDR. Um, that was supposed to go into effect this year, but now it's been pushed uh, for next year. But it reclassified a lot of the software systems, uh, specifically software systems that would be uh, kind of MDDS that, that would take data displayed, but allow other users uh, to interpret the data. So if a physician looks at your sensor data uh, or your, your sleep data or your, your dietary data and makes decisions based off that data, that software system, even though it's just displaying data as is, the raw data came in, now most likely will be classified either in a class 2A or a class 3, uh, which puts a much, much higher burden. So you see different trends, you know, in the FDA kind of deregulating, uh, but in Europe it's more regulatory, more regulatory burden. But again, that in a global environment that keeps changing. Um, so that's those are kind of the things we look for and we understood uh, what the risks are and we kind of prepare for that. Uh, in an environment that uh, we don't always com completely control. Back to you, Keith. Good. Did you want to comment on um, FDA regulation of mobile oh, apps, Abbas? Sure. Um, sorry, forgot about that. Uh, <laughs> so the FDA, um, as I said, continues to refine the functions, uh, what they regulate and not regulate. Um, when mobile apps were newer, uh, back, you know, almost 10 years ago, uh, FDA did not understand what they should and they shouldn't control. They took an approach, which is sensible, as to kind of, you know, assume, um, take a backseat and kind of approach and uh, and see what happens. But now they started to, you know, regulate a lot of these functions, specifically if you start using your devices and sensors that are devices. As, as we know, the, the devices themselves, mobile devices themselves become much and more powerful. There's more and more sensors added. So there's devices out there, apps out there that use the light or the camera or the vibrations or other sources um, on the device for medical use. Once you start doing that, you enter that regulatory uh, bubble, and that's where FDA starts to uh, regulate your stuff. So a few examples that are out there, uh, as we have listed some here, uh, I'm not gonna read all of them, but you know, there's, there's a whole lot more there. Um, so just again, the point here is you know, the, the environment changes, the regulatory standards are changing. So as you start um, creating systems or, or devices that require connectivity or require use of newer technologies, um, you always want to assume, uh, take take the path, um, the higher road, which means you know, assume it's it's regulatory regulated and use use that as an approach to design and develop your your applications or your devices. Okay. Thank you, Abbas. Okay. Those are our four trends, and what I'd like to leave you with are, are some tips for 2020 and beyond. Now, I'm, we have found that a lot of the folks that attend our webinars, you're focusing on the, the medicine of your device, the science of your device, the engineering of your device, bringing it from benchtop prototype to the point where you can produce it for clinical trials. And that should certainly be your focus. But we would suggest don't lose sight of the areas that we've talked about today and view them not as hurdles or burdens, but view them as challenges that provide opportunity for your market success. Uh, specifically in the area of artificial intelligence, think about your device, think about the data that it produces, and think about how AI and data analytics could improve 
your existing device performance or perhaps provide new applications, treat new disease states using your existing platform. In the area of connect and 5G, what opportunities would higher bandwidth and greater reach and coverage create for your device? A telemedicine, think beyond the traditional telemedicine being, you know, uh, remote uh, robotics and patient provider visual uh, visits. Think about how uh, if your medical device can benefit from real time and remote operation, monitoring and control. And then finally, regulatory, there are opportunities there as well. Um, how you should you should answer the question, how does device firmware and cloud connectivity affect your FDA status. Maybe there's some differentiators there. And then lastly, number five, let us know if we can help you. We're certainly looking for customers, but more importantly, we're looking for partners, uh, medical device companies that we can team with and share in one another's success. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, our Galen Cloud Incentive Program is a way in which you can answer the question, does the Galen Cloud meet your connectivity needs? We will provide to you uh, at no cost, a fully operational Galen cl Cloud environment, no cost for two months. There are certain qualification uh, requirements that we can work through with you. The program eligibility period ends in a couple months, uh, August 31st. If you're interested in finding out more, uh, you can send an email to incentive at galendata.com and both this handout and a handout on Galen uh, data in general is available in the handout section of your console. I'm also very excited to announce that we're going to take a deeper dive into our first trend today, AI and data analytics, at our July webinar. Uh, the title of that webinar is Analytics and Machine Learning to Enhance Digital Health. We're very excited to have Angela Holmes, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Mercury Data Science. Uh, MDS has a major life sciences division that uh, Angela heads up, and she's got a wealth of indi industry experience. I think it'll be a valuable program for everybody. Um, there should be a registration link in your console now to register for that webinar. With that, we're going to open it up uh, for questions. I see there's some questions coming in already. So you can ask them in the console on the right. You can certainly contact us at any time by giving us a call, visiting our website, or sending us an email. Uh, the first question is, if I have an AI concept from my medical device, can, da can, Galen, da can Galen Data help develop the AI software modules? We do not do AI software module development specifically. That's where we would uh, bring in the expertise of uh, Mercury Data Science, uh, Elder Research, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, personally, I do have a um, few decades in applying data analytics and AI to practical applications. So I could definitely uh, be very interested in finding out what your idea is and steering you in the right direction. Uh, next question is, do I need to build 5G technology directly into my device in order to take advantage of 5G connectivity? Who would like to take that one? So I can, I can take it. Um, as of as of right now, uh, I believe the answer is yes. I can I can follow up the question asker to kind of better understand the use case exactly, um, but uh, and and how. Yeah, I, I might need to hear the question question repeated again, but um, I, I can follow up with that with that asker offline um, about their specific use case and how the data would be uh, would be extracted. Very good. Very good. Um, Abbas, this is a good question for you, just came in. Which cloud provider is utilized for the Galen Cloud solution? So currently we are deployed on Amazon Web Services, uh, although our architecture allows us essentially to um, deploy across a set of um, cloud infrastructure providers like Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud or IBM or any other cloud provider. But as of right now, it's all AWS. Very good. Looking at the uh, questions console here, keep those questions coming. Uh, here's another question. Uh, Chris, I'll bounce this one over to you. 
is the Galen Cloud configured to provide telemedicine services? Absolutely. The Galen data is, is purpose, purpose built for medical device and specifically for sensor collection, any type of data collection. We can also receive videos, we can receive ultrasounds, x-rays. Uh, we support 20 or 30 different data types and that data type list is growing all the time. But I think telemedicine is changing. I think COVID is proving that. And I always like to point out that most medical devices today are not connected to the internet. We saw a change that started to happen about three years ago where companies were coming, out, coming to us and asking us to build FDA compliant clouds. And that was really the genesis of Galen uh, because it's very expensive to build these custom solutions. With COVID, I, I think it's crazy. You see on the news all the time, these, these cars line up for hours to drive through a tent get their nose swabbed, and then wait two or three weeks to get the results. I don't think that's going to be acceptable before. So I think, yes, existing telemedicine, as is today with webcams and video conferencing, but I think there's going to be an explosion in data collection that supports all of that in near real time. And to be competitive going forward, I think most medical devices will have to provide some type of connectivity. It's a great question, Keith. Thank you. And, and a good answer, Chris. Chris, thank you for that. Um, Next question, a boss, regulatory question. How can medical device innovators prepare for the upcoming regulatory changes as the FDA catches up to the current state of data transfer and data manipulation in remote locations? Yeah, so there, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, in terms of what will be regulated, how it will be regulated. Uh, whereas, uh, as we see, you know, um, just I talked in, in the presentation, we see uh, some aspects uh, of being less enforced in, in the new world, you know, like MDDS or CDS, uh, talks about making algorithm changes, something that happens automatically instead of a uh, design control process. So there's uncertainty whether those will happen uh, or they will continue as is. If you look over Europe, there's um, even more uncertainty there. So the best thing you can do, again, as we advise everybody that we talk to is, you know, assume that your device is going to be regulated, regulated at a higher rate. Just design for that. Even if you don't implement that design controls right now, make sure you design for that. Make sure you understand that at some point you may cross a threshold from being a non-medical device to a medical device. So it's easier to prepare upfront than to have to go back and redo a bunch of stuff. Anyways, what FDA says or and all these design controls are not some magic thing that you do just for the FDA. These are like best engineering practices. You must be doing them regardless. Uh, it's more a matter of doing them in a methodical way and then documenting and providing objective evidence. That overhead when you do it during design cycle is not that great. But if you have to go back and kind of re-architect or redesign, uh, that cost can be pretty, uh, pretty high. And, and may even shut you off uh, from certain markets. So just assume assume regulatory over, uh, reach will you know, be there and um, prepare for that. Very good, thank you, Abbas. Um, gentlemen, those are all the questions we have. Is there anything that uh, you all would like to add that we uh, may not have touched on yet? I'll jump in here. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining. We know there's there's great opportunity I've been in the medical device industry for a long time. It's one of the companies I started with still doesn't have connectivity. Um, I think that going forward, you know, the people that use medical devices will demand connectivity. I think there's a real op opportunity for connectivity. And yes, there is certain risk in connectivity, but I think there's far greater risk in not having a connected medical device. And I wanna emphasize this one more time. There is no equivalent of a check engine light in medical device. So if that medical device has a broken lead, a bad capacitor, resistor, inductor, or some type of electronic component, or the battery simply going down, that therapy that that medical device is providing can stop. Wouldn't you want to know as a patient, as a caregiver, as a parent, that that medical device has stopped performing? And so I think there's far greater risk in not having connectivity than just having good information at the tips of your finger to make well-informed well decisions about the health of the device and the health of the patient. Thanks, Keith, for letting me have that opportunity to share that. You're welcome. We've got uh, two more questions that just come in. Um, the first is, what are the first steps you go through when someone is interested in implementing Galen's platform? Good question. Who wants to take that? 
I can speak to that. So um, it depends on where you are in the in the design cycle. Um, so if your device is ready, um, your device has at least some hardware uh, available uh, in terms of integration. So for any kind of cloud connectivity, you at least need some kind of internet access either directly or if you don't have direct internal access, uh, so you don't have a Wi-Fi or Ethernet or a cellular uh, chipsets, um, then you may have a Bluetooth antenna in your device. That means that will be you know, some way to transfer data out of a device into maybe a hub or an app or something like that that can then talk to your uh, the cloud. So it depends on where your device is, what capabilities has. Um, when we start, assuming you have the device and, and you have figured out the use case, what we do is work with you and your software team uh, to kind of do the integration. We provide all the APIs, all the documentation that needs to be done. And we come, we work with you as a partner. Uh, so we always, always consider you know, uh, customers, but they are partners to work in kind of implementing that digital health component uh, in terms of data connectivity, data you know, analysis, any kind of visualization. We set up all the dashboards and work with you guys uh, to understand uh, how this implementation will benefit your customers or, or patients or providers in general. Thank you, Abbas. Uh, another question. How does Galen Data handle data collected from patients in the EU in terms of regulatory compliance in markets outside the US, e.g. privacy issue? Yeah, so I could take that as well. Uh, so we do deployments, physical deployments uh, in, in different jurisdictions. So as far as Europe is concerned, for example, data stays in Europe. Uh, that's one thing we do. Um, you still have access, uh, so access required. You know, there's some privacy shield uh, availability that allows us to move data between uh, for access for view, uh, for viewing only, and only from certain locations. So we, we kind of work that way around. Um, but data resides primarily in the EU. Um, there are other requirements, like for example, France has its own set of requirements on, on kind of the first hit requirement. So again, we deploy uh, our services on on infrastructure that's in France. So it's our headache uh, to manage uh, the regulatory kind of burden in terms of deployment. If you use our services, you don't have to worry. You just say, hey, given the, uh, I need to be in Germany. I need to be in, in Luxembourg. I need to be in France. Make it happen. And then we take on the ownership. We take on the kind of the understanding burden and we take on the risks uh, to kind of implement that. And here is our last question. It relates to um, hospital infrastructure and internal IT systems and hospitals. For devices used in hospitals, do healthcare facilities generally welcome connected devices to integrate to their IT infrastructure? What requirements do healthcare care facilities generally request prior to allowing connected medical devices to interface with their IT infrastructures? I'll take this one and Abash, you can bag me up. And then it's really a two part answer is that getting into the hospital infrastructure it's not it's a non-trivial exercise but imagine that it's a medical device you have at home it's sending and collecting information to the galen cloud once you're in the hospital infrastructure the the, the physician can get access to that data through the normal desktops that they use or whatever system they use assuming the patient grants them access and so galen we have something called an observer role that the patient determines who has access to their data and they can make that immediately available to the to the physician or any caregiver or family member. Now, also if, if the sensor, and we're seeing more and more of this, is that the, the sensors have direct cell capability. So as long as you're on the outer walls of the hospital or in a clinical setting, you don't need to be part of the hospital infrastructure. And I think there's a real value in that. And clearly we see a technology trend heading in that direction. Uh, then the, the third more complicated one, and, and our customer, and just to be clear, our customers are not the hospitals, our customers are the device manufacturers. And so that's who we interact directly. It's the manufacturer of the devices that actually deploy to the hospital environment. Each hospital is different, each region is different. It is, it is complicated uh, to get into the hospital infrastructure for obvious reasons. Abbas, anything else you wanna to add to that? No, so I mean, it, it's, I think the, the answer, you know, kind of first part is hospitals do welcome it because again, their their whole goal is to make you know healthcare delivery and patient's life and improvement of the patient quality of life. Uh, that's kind of the goal, that's why they exist. So they do expect uh, devices to come in, new devices, new technologies to come in. 
they do have a concern, however, in terms of HIPAA, in terms of policy, uh, because there's a lot of onus on them being the kind of the manager of those data. And so they do, you know, it, it's a challenge, as Chris said. Uh, every hospital is different. Some hospitals have a better process. Uh, some hospitals don't. And it just depends on the hospital or what kind of process they need. Um, but they are getting more and more open. Uh, they understand the power of the cloud. They understand the power of the ability and to collect data once the patient leaves the hospital. And there's a, there's a lot of value-based care approaches uh, implemented in the United States, but implemented in other places as well, where the, the hospitals are paid uh, based on the value they provide, not on, on the hours that they spent, not on the, medicines, the amount of medicines they give you, the value they provide. A lot of time, value for providing providing value does not end when the patient leaves the hospital. So they understand all that, and there's there's just more, much more openness now in the hospital system to you know connect um, connect their infrastructure uh, with devices that allow them to um, make that. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for an interesting discussion today, and and thanks especially to our audience for attending our webinar and for your very insightful questions. We look forward to seeing you at a future Galen Data webinar. Please let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you with before then. You can see our contact information here. Uh, thanks again and goodbye.